Well, hello, friends. It is uh, good to be able to ponder and to reflect on the scriptures together. So, so thank you for joining me in it. Now, Richard has been guiding us through a, a way of thinking and imagining uh, about the mission of God and also what it would mean for us to think and imagine ourselves as uh, missional people in our own selves. And I thought that today, rather than trying to uh, continue Richard's particular trajectory, his particular thrust, uh, I would leave that for him uh, to pick up on uh, once he has returned from his compassionate leave. So instead, while I will stay with the topic of mission, what I'd like to do is to offer uh, an idea, a reflection that really jumped out at me strongly while I was reflecting on our gospel passage for today. And particularly what it might have to do with being people of God's mission in a world that is not entirely perfect. So, let's get at it. I speak to you today in the name of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, our text today is pretty busy. There's a core group of Jesus' disciples, and today they are getting their driver's licenses. Uh, they are being sent out. And this is the first time that these disciples are going to be out, uh, sort of winging it on their own and doing what their master has done uh, and in their master's name. It is heady stuff. I mean, it's chock full of excitement. There's power and there's authority being granted over stuff. They're heading out on the road, you know, getting stuff done, accomplishing things. You know, they're shaking dust off their feet. There's a cosmic judgment leveled against their opponents. It's also, of course, filled with stuff that is pretty daunting if you really think about it, right? Like being told that part of your job is to go out and to raise the dead. Uh, to expect rejection and failure pretty much everywhere you go, and then to be told that the only tools you're going to get are the shirt that are on your back and the hope that you carry in your heart, your faith. But you know, amidst all of the flash and the challenge of this reading is a little bit that I think is really crucial to how we understand the whole thing. Um, but it really is very easy to overlook in all of the excitement. You see, at the start of our reading, um, Jesus is going about his mission. You know, he's showing that God's kingdom has come near by his words and his actions. He's healing people uh, as he meets, as he goes. And as he's doing this, uh, Jesus is struck by a particular reaction. Uh, he reacts to what he sees uh, all around him. And what he sees are people who are, who are thrown around. He looks around and he sees people that are, are, are torn apart. Uh, the way it's described is kind of like if uh, a shepherd were just to you know, check out on, on his or her flock and the wolves could pretty much do whatever they felt like whenever they felt like doing it. Jesus encounters wherever he goes the damages of the imperfections, of the wrongs of our world, and so of the lives that we end up living in that world. And everywhere he goes, Jesus sees how that damage crushes people and indeed traps them. His reaction to this is immediate and it is strong. Now, our translation in our Bible takes a pretty passive approach to this here. Uh, he had compassion for them, we read. You know, but the underlying Greek actually speaks of a, a pretty powerful and a pretty urgent reaction rising from, from Jesus' core, I mean, the, the very center of his person. So, our Bible translation is a little bit of a clue for us in some of the difficulty that we have wrapping our minds around this. See, sometimes when we hear uh, of God's love or compassion or, you know, or we're talking about it, we end up framing it or imagining it as something that's kind of ethereal or, or, or not really earthly, you know? Something that has no real 
bearing or impact uh, on ourselves or, or the world that's around us, and really just kind of helps to make us feel better about where we happen to be at. And I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, the love and the compassion of God certainly makes a big deal uh, to how we feel about where, where we are at on, on any given day, and thanks be to God for that. But, but that's not really what's meant here. I mean, here, literally, Jesus' guts are rising up, you know, like almost sort of pouring out. That's kind of the, the force of it. Pouring out for those that he sees suffering, uh, the wounding that life in this world can and does inflict. So it's out of that reaction, you know, that powerful, that urgent compassion of God for the world that he's made and that suffers in so many different ways that the mission of God springs forth. It is the genesis of the whole thing. You know, it's the primary orientation of God to his world, and, and that's why it is key to how we understand not just what God is up to, but also what God invites us to participate in. Because make no mistake, he invites us to share in what he's about. You know, we're invited to be a people who don't just feel God's compassion. I mean, we do, as it courses into us and through us, but, but who are also empowered and at the same time governed to some extent by it. It leads us to a particular kind of being, and so through that to a particular kind of action. Uh, there is a uh, hilarious little exchange. I mean, at least I find it hilarious. Maybe you won't, but uh, Jesus notes uh, that there is literally no end to the opportunities for the application of God's compassion in this world. And then he invites his disciples to pray, you know, that God might just send, oh, I don't know, somebody, you know, to pitch in. Here, by the way, is a spirituality pro tip. You should always beware of praying something like, you know, Lord, you know, won't you please send somebody to minister to this particular thing that I'm sort of standing right in front of and I'm, I'm seeing it and I'm feeling that it's very important. Because the answer that you just might get is, he has, and you're it. Congratulations. Now, thinking about mission as stemming from, you know, originating in, our participation in this urgent and, and impactful compassion of God gives us what I think is, is a more helpful take on the remainder of our passage. So Jesus tells his disciples to go out and in effect, in effect, to get at what Jesus has been at. You know, starting in, uh, in that compassion that uh, pours out of Jesus, they are to go and they are to show that the kingdom of God has come near. You know, that there's a, a way of being that is at hand, and this way of being is life-giving in a truer sense, and that's because it's predicated on a love that actually makes a difference. You know, the disciples are to travel light, and that's partly because their testimony isn't about trying to bring awesome stuff to show off or to things that they kind of rely on. Rather, their testimony is, is, is their own selves, actually. It's about the difference that participating in that love has made for them. It's what they have to bring, you know, if I can use that language. Their job is just to live amongst others and to take those opportunities to act on God's calling of compassion as those opportunities come up, allowing the ways in which God's love flows in and through them to direct them as they try to figure out the best way to interact with and to serve others in all the different ways that they do. Now, as the disciples run into hostility, into trouble, maybe even into straight-up evil, because the world is not perfect, neither are the disciples, so of course they're going to, eventually, the disciples are to acknowledge it. There is no denial 
here. There is no sweeping things under the rug. And again, we return to that problem we have sometimes of thinking again of, of God's love as being this kind of not earthly, ethereal thing with no impact. The compassion of God is not opposed to the justice of God. It's not as though they're two different things and they're kind of kept in totally separate rooms. No, they, they both flow forth from the heart of God. So participating in the compassion of, sorry, participating in what the compassion of Jesus leads them into, the disciples will note where things are as they should not be. Uh, they will end up speaking to those things. In fact, they are to shake the dust from their shoes, which is not just a testimony to the wrong itself, but it's also a repudiation of the wrong, a distancing of the self from the wrong. Having said that, there is a limit to what the disciples will do in the face and in the fact of wrong. Where the disciples are going to stop is at the point of presuming to stand in judgment over the souls of others. You know, to weigh the merit or the value of a person, and then to dole out condemnation upon them if they're found wanting by human perception. This is one of the limits that is imposed upon the disciples' participation in God's mission, and it is imposed by the governing of God's compassion. It colors how the disciples are to handle their own action uh, in the face of hostility and of evil. So, if divine judgment is to fall, is to come, it's going to be the divine who delivers it and who handles it. The disciples are going to have to be content with that. Well, if they're not going to level judgment, what are they going to do? The answer is that they will keep on going. They will keep on carrying on. Working at sharing shalom, peace. I mean, as best as they can in their own imperfect ways. By way of being people who have themselves been changed by the compassion of God. And so embody that compassion, again, in their own imperfect ways in the world around them. Let me wrap things up. One of the things that I have had my eye on in the last couple of days, with increasing dismay, I will say, uh, is the increasing allegations of uh, misconduct and of abuse of First Nations people uh, by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And witnessing the difficulty of some senior RCMP personnel uh, to wrestle in what looks like a serious way uh, with the structural and the societal implications of what those allegations point to. Now, as I sit with dismay in my heart, I find that uh, my mind turns to reflect on not just the history of the RCMP with First Nations people, but of course, the history of my own church with the First Nations people. And as I engage in that reflection, I am reminded of, and uh, again become more conscious of the enormous amount of work that is still left to be done in making amends uh, for the ongoing effects of what was done in the name of mission and in the name of our God uh, to them by us. So friends, that is what happens when we, as people of God, forget that participation in God's mission begins with participation in God's compassion. That's what happens when we forget that the wellspring of mission is our experience of and transformation by the compassion of God. When we forget that, mission ends up becoming, well, I don't know, something else. You know, something that ends up being more self-serving, self 
self-justifying, uh, self-empowering, you know, making use of others to fulfill our aims, our, our, our schemes, our agendas, and ultimately our egos. It is, a, uh, it is a real and it is a terrible thing for us to fail in that way. And you know, when we do it big enough, it can take generations for the wounding that we cause to heal. I mention this because I would really like to leave you with the idea that the invitation to experience and to participate in the compassion of God, I mean, to really see that as the heart of what mission is actually about, is not a small thing. It's easily overlooked. There are so many bigger, flashier things on our horizon sometimes, but, you know, when we forget it, there really is a cost to ourselves. There's a cost to others. And there's a cost to our capacity to act as participants in God's mission in a world that is filled with imperfection, not least of all, in our own hearts. But you know, when we remember it, and when we work at giving ourselves to it, what we find is that there really is opportunity for us to be people who can show that God's kingdom really does come near, even in our imperfect ways, even in our imperfect words, and even in our imperfect beings. Amen.